Hello to the chicos, hello to the chicas. Exciting book review time. Um, for the first time in my very short book reviewing history, I am going to be somewhat current. I'm reviewing today a book that uh, hasn't been out for too long, but nonetheless, I was very, very excited to receive it and review it. So today on the menu is Nigel Short's Winning. Um, a book that, um, like I said, I was eagerly looking forward to. I didn't quite understand why it was called Winning, actually, and uh, I was like, mm, interesting title there, perhaps a bit self-serving even, or um, I don't know how to put it, but uh, I wasn't sure where that was going until I opened up the book and figured out that Nigel Short's Winning is actually about eight tournaments that he ended up winning. Uh, and so all of a sudden it makes perfect sense. Nonetheless, I think it perhaps would have been an interesting idea to call the book winning uh, my greatest tournament victories or something like that. Perhaps it would have made it uh, clearer what the book was all about without actually uh, reading the introduction and the preface. But I guess uh, this is a minor issue. So the book uh, has got eight tournament victories in it with every single game played in those tournaments thoroughly analyzed both in commentary and variations. All this written by uh, Nigel Short, current uh, FIDE, I don't know, vice president, whatever, uh, official. And I'm saying this because a lot of people are judging him uh, more as a uh, FIDE official rather than a chess persona or an author, so I would like to clarify that my stance currently, or rather just in general, is that I'm reviewing the book, not so much um, Nigel Short himself, so that I just wanted to put aside. So, thoughts on the book. It's bloody good. I love the book. It's really, really enjoyable. It's an excellent read. I always enjoy reading books that are written by people who are native English speakers, and their English is pretty good, obviously. Uh, for someone like me who is uh, English second language, I don't know why, but I really appreciate uh, fine craft doing well. And um, yeah, his, his English, uh, his writing style is very cool. Now, speaking of the style and the writing, um, I expected something and I got exactly what I expected. It's funny, it's quirky, it's provocative. And... Um, I don't know, to my taste, uh, on a few occasions, it overstepped a few lines um, of, I don't know, inappropriate probably would be a good way to put it, just for the sake of squeezing in a few more funny lines. It's up to your taste. Um, look, uh, he gets away with it. Um, yeah, uh, in interesting definitely to, to see how he perceives his fellow uh, chess players and uh, grandmasters and whatnot. But overall, um, my greatest criticism towards the book is actually um, is that I wanted it to be more. I wanted it to have a bit more meat. And I'm saying that despite of the fact that it has got 400 pages of games and text in it. But somehow I feel like it's a little bit too short, excuse the pun, and um, doesn't always tell us all the good stories that happened um, in those and during those tournaments. Um, yeah. 400 pages, still mighty impressive, but if I compare it to the Judith Polga books, what I really like about these, and the third one was too far away from me, so I didn't grab it, is that they just did not hold back. Judith gave everything in those books, and so there is a little bit more in the Judith books in every department, a little bit more pictures, a little bit more stories a little bit more games, more puzzles, more a little bit more analysis at points. So I just felt like, yeah, I, I just would have loved to read more. But again, how can you criticize a book not being large enough if it's 400 pages? So that's a, a, an interesting point to counter. But uh, I would have loved to read more from someone who once upon a time actually fought for the world championship title. What's very interesting is that these eight victories all come from uh, round-robin tournaments, and hopefully he's going to write a follow-up, winning two, which is going to feature his successes and victories in open tournaments, well, which are also incredibly numerous. I was just thinking about it the other day, by the way, that um, Nigel Short has got a, a very impressive longevity uh, in terms of being a chess player on very much on the top and near the top. He's no longer a top 
Grandmaster, but he's still 2600 plus G and winning tournaments around the globe and scoring really well. So I don't know, it's it's quite impressive. And uh, yeah, it was mighty time that he came out with a book um, about his uh, very impressive career. So let's jump into uh, some of the content that I would like to share with you. This one is uh, from a tournament, this game that he played in Iran. Uh, once again, he told some very interesting stories there that I really enjoyed reading. And once again, I would have loved to, to hear more. So his opponent here is uh, Gaim Magami, a local Iranian grandmaster, a very talented dude. And um, here, Short somehow drifts away from his beloved E4 and uh, plays perhaps somewhat fittingly in English instead, which actually ends up uh, in a very stock standard hedgehog variation. Now, the reason why I really felt that this game was absolutely awesome, because here the author in the white trunks is playing an opening that is not necessarily part of his overall repertoire, because even if uh, E4, certain Sicilian lines allow the hedgehog, this double fianchetto is definitely not uh, on the agenda there. So he needed to be quite creative and resourceful to find the best moves here. And he came up with an absolutely remarkable idea here that uh, I find absolutely astonishing. And frankly, it would never occur to me to play this move here. Now it would because I saw this, but boy, Bishop H3. Wow. Um, yeah, I mean, most... Uh, Mere mortals like myself, he would be looking at rook c1, rook d1, pawn f4. Probably I, we would pick a move out of these uh, three moves. And not that they are bad, but when I look at bishop h3, I'm like, yeah, that's the real stuff, man. Like this sack, excuse me, followed by knight d5 is absolutely deadly, man. So black was somewhat forced to actually defend the pawn on e6. And after b4... He had to rely on uh, some cool defensive ideas like rook d8, which Nigel quick to point out, to quick to point out by the way that he totally blundered this. And on this note, I want to mention that, as you would expect from the book, um, the author is not uh, particularly shy um, from you know he's not shying away from criticizing his opponents or their moves and whatnot. But at the same time. He's definitely giving the same amount of grief, in fact, far more to himself. And I respect that. So he definitely knows his own worth too and uh, criticizes himself regularly across the pages. In fact, I will go back to that uh, with the next game. So yeah, it's uh, interesting to see a book where probably the author is a little bit more honest. <laughs> I think is a good way to put it than what we are used to. Um, less political, perhaps, is another good way to go. Anyway, rook c1, bishop c8, and this is where the fun begins, but I need to already show you here that uh, knight e4, knight e4, knight e4 would lose to rook e4, bishop e4, knight e6, f6, bishop e6, rook f7 only, queen d4, and checkmate Reno is incoming. Now, this game is full of mind-blowing variations that are based on the idea of sacrificing pieces exploiting the weak long diagonal um, but I don't want to preempt all this for you so that you can enjoy yourself but I want to show you how the game went because it's uh, quite a treat so after 97 now it looks like our attack has been kind of uh, pushed back but uh, the exact opposite is the truth and here the stock standard Sicilian sacrifice with 95 is as natural as a baby's smile as good old Bobby would say, take, take, and knight c6. And um, with the long diagonal again being the main uh, motive, alongside with this deadly horse on c6, it's just not a tenable position. Out of curiosity, the engine now already screams plus three and a half at least for wife. And uh, yeah, on top of these two pieces now, um, white is just going to sweep black off the board in the center. A really brilliant attack. I mean, look at that knight b8 move. He's begging that knight to take the rook on d8. Takes, takes. And this is just such a picturesque position and a beautiful way to finish this game. Um, it's quite amazing that uh, the black pieces are basically on the 7th, 8th, 9th and the 10th rank. They are so passive. And white's attack just, yeah, it keeps on coming and never stops. And the finish is quite pretty too. Um, queen h6, take, take, take. And after knight c6, uh, he just mows down everything. Rook takes 
Oopsie. Queen takes and bishop takes. And mate on h7. Not that the reason why we needed to take on c6 was because after bishop takes, bishop takes, the queen covers the mate on h7. Hence, first the decoy, then the bishop takes, and then the mate. Total carnage. Beautiful chess. Really, really amazing, beautiful chess. And the book is full of such marvelous games with quite detailed analysis. Um, and I'm going to now show you just one more thing before I conclude the review. This game and the provided analysis and the thoughts afterwards, um, one of the, if not the most profound and uh, really hardcore hitting home kind of uh, comments I have ever read in a chess book. It was just, yeah, a really cool revelation to me when I read this. So let me let me just uh, give you this uh, game without uh, the context first and you will appreciate it perhaps even more. So all you need to know for the time being is that uh, Short is black against Portish and uh, he is playing a Dutch Stonewall and not a lot really to write home about for either side. Uh, a little bit lackluster way to treat it with white. Uh, I think Portish preferred safety above everything else. And with this very clever g5 attacking idea, I think black is very much in control of the game. At least in terms of not having to worry about losing it. Um, and um, here, after Queen F2, Nigel makes a remark, very much in spirit of what I told you earlier, where he came, claims that every patsa would have taken on F4, uh, ruining the white pawn structure. But for some mysterious reason, he played instead G4. I mean, the reason is very understandable. He wants to uh, exploit the E4 square, but this plan overall was just not quite good. And so at this position, he offers a draw and the draw was taken. So you go like, why the heck are you showing this to us? And the only reason why I'm showing this to you is actually the comments that he provides after the game, because this game was played in the seventh round of a tournament where Short started off with six out of six. And we are not talking about the, uh, you know, the, the local under 14 uh, boys championship uh, where he started six out of six, but it was a Grandmaster round robin category 16, whatever, top players of the world exclusively in the field, and he starts with six out of six. That's like bonkers. And then he plays against Portish, who, by the way, former world number four, and uh, plays this draw, and his comments, I can't read them enough times, and I'm not going to read the whole thing that he says here, but uh, just the last two paragraphs, this sp spoke to me so much and I really do think that our current, especially the young elite uh, near the top of the chess world, who are playing draws all the time whenever it suits and even when it doesn't, would probably learn a lot from these thoughts. Check this out. This was the precise point where my momentum evaporated, as in in the tournament uh, after six out of six and then drawing this game. Until here, with the exception of a tenacious but nevertheless fluky win against Korchnoi, I had been playing great chess. The point is not that I had continued against Sportish, I would have won. Nobody knows what would have happened. The point is that I had to continue to strive. Very, very powerful message. Even defeat would not have been a disaster. But when you commit a crime against the game of chess, as I did here, the gods have a way of punishing you, as I would soon find out. Such a profound message. I, I really love that. That he is blaming himself for a, an early draw in a tournament where he's leading six out of six, more so than for a defeat. And he's totally right too, because... It's not so much the concept of, okay, I've just played a draw without playing for it, but the fact that he was on fire, six out of six, and he himself put that fire out by agreeing to a draw in a position like this, which admittedly is pretty equal-ish in terms of the evaluation bar, but boy, there is a lot of play in this position, so it's totally fine to play on. And so, as you could see, that is a very, very harsh self-criticism there, 
and he feels that the punishment that he received for it was also uh, well deserved and um, for very exciting thoughts and insights like that alone uh, winning by Nigel Short is a, a, a really great read I very highly recommend this book the only difference that I would like to highlight between this and the Judith Polgar books is that perhaps this book um, because of it offers a little bit less at least for my liking in terms of variations and the text explaining moves maybe lower rated players will find at points to follow his lines and his train of thoughts but for the most part I reckon that anyone would immensely enjoy uh, Nigel Short's uh, winning so be sure to add this to your shopping list if you are keen on collecting uh, books that uh, assemble a certain player's uh, games across the career definitely Nigel Short's winning uh, is a book that will be a pride of your bookshelf so that was my book review on uh, Nigel Short's winning um, and uh, thank you very much for tuning in I will be back with more soon bye